I'm now really excited to introduce Jesse Daniels on why now is the time for l racial literacy in tech. Jesse is a professor at Hunter College Sociology and at the Graduate Center at the CUNY of Africana Studies, Critical Social Psychology and Sociology. Her unconventional career path has led her to work outside of academia in both the tech industry as well as the Rikers Island. The main focus of her research is in race and digital media technologies. She is an internationally recognized expert on the internet manifestation of racism and was recently invited to speak about her work at the United Nations in Geneva. Jessie is the author or co uh, editor of five books and she's working on a few more right now. And some of her publications include Tweetstorm, The Rise of the Far Right, The Mainstreaming of White Supremacy, and How Tech and Media Helped. Help me welcome Jesse. Welcome. We who create and use technology are functionally illiterate when it comes to racial matters. And we are living at a time when we need to get much smarter, much faster about race and tech. Now is the time for racial literacy in tech, and I'm going to explain why. Right now, we are living in dangerous times, times when a simple online search can, su can suggest you have a criminal record if you are black or your, simply your name sounds black, as Professor LaTanya Sweeney has discovered. We are living in a time when search algorithms use the data of racist search terms to serve up autocomplete suggestions that further racist ideology, as Sophia Noble has written about. We're living at a time when AI is used to speed up the existing fault lines of racial inequality in housing, education, hiring, and in systems of criminal justice when the new Jim Crow risks becoming the new Jim Code, as Ruha Benjamin has written. We're living at a time when, social when every social platform becomes immediately vulnerable to white nationalist innovation opportunists, as I've written about. The dangerous times we are living in are created by design and have unintended consequences that harm us all. Just as tech designed only for and by sighted people works less well for everyone, as Chansey Fleet noted in her data bite last week, tech designed with only white people in mind works less well for all of us. The way we think about race and tech right now is trapped in cul-de-sacs. Cul-de-sacs, these inventions of American suburbia, engender seclusion, a lack of diversity, and a disassociation from the reality of contact with other people. By design, they limit possibility and connection. So what are these current cul-de-sacs in our thinking about race and tech? Well, there are three that I want to mention. There are probably many more. The first, the most common idea, one we hear a lot in discussions of race and tech, race and tech is that we have a pipeline issue. If only there were a greater supply of black and Latinx people ready to be hired, then this problem would be solved. But the reality is that there are people here now ready and qualified to be hired, but they are not hired in equitable numbers. And when they are hired, they, all, they very often face a miserable experience within tech companies that value the dominant culture and ignore the perspectives and rich lived experiences of those diversity hires once their numbers are counted and reported. The second approach that's been tried in tech is to talk about implicit bias. There's some excellent work in this field. I want to shout out Jennifer, Jennifer Eberhardt, who's done um, a recent book in this area. But there are some serious flaws with other work, as many have pointed out. Some 20 years on since this field was started, the lofty promises of the idea of implicit bias have failed to yield any real change. In fact, this is perhaps the most constraining of these cul-de-sacs because it leaves the impression that our brains are hardwired for bias and there's little that we can do about it. Most recently, there have been promising discussions in the tech world about ethics and fairness, but so far, these have obfuscated the issue of race through abstraction. 
So how do we get out of these cul-de-sacs? How do we reconfigure our thinking? What we, my co-authors Mutali and Conde and Dark Mir and I propose in launching Advancing Racial Literacy in Tech is a new way forward out of these cul-de-sacs. Racial literacy includes three components. One, a cognitive and intellectual component. We can all learn some new things about the way race operates. An emotional or psychological component. Dealing with race brings up emotions that we need the capacity, and we need the capacity to manage those. And third, it involves a commitment to action, which is necessarily rooted in ethics and values. Research has demonstrated that positive framing and appealing to people's innate desire to look good to others can be harnessed to make workplaces more equitable. Racial literacy builds on this work by reframing the problem of race and tech as one that people in the dominant culture can and must take some responsibility for and make a positive change in. Racial literacy combines internet literacy with critical media literacy and with an understanding of systemic racism. Media literacy alone, as Dana Boyd has argued, backfires, and indeed it has. The young people I interviewed for my book of cyber racism, who had internet literacy only skills, could look at cloak sites, those disguised propaganda websites, and conclude, well, maybe slavery wasn't so bad. I mean, there are two sides to everything. In the conclusion of cyber racism, I call for this combination of internet literacy, critical media literacy, and racial literacy based on the fact that the young people I interviewed for that book were able to detect the propaganda and cloak sites when they had a com combination of internet literacy, the ability to look at one of these sites and say, well, the site just looks like an individual made it. I don't know if I would trust it. With internet literacy, with racial literacy, as young as one young person put it, this site says slavery wasn't that bad, but I know, based on other evidence, that it was bad. It was a thoroughly evil institution. Racial literacy em emphasizes skill building and expanding our capacity to deal with racially stressful situations and centering the concerns of black, Latinx, and other people of color. As Dr. Howard Stevenson has described in his two decades of work on racial literacy and his session with us here earlier at Data and Society, when we encounter racially stressful situations, our body has a physiological response that we are often not aware of in the moment. What is, it, what is a racially stressful encounter for one person might not be for another person, but often we don't know when those are happening for someone else. Racial literacy means recognizing when racially stressful, stressful encounters are happening and increasing our capacity for understanding our own emotional and physiological responses to these encounters. I want to talk about moments of, um, of racial literacy. Ijeoma Aluo, in a recent piece for The Guardian, writes, quote, at a workshop I led last week, a white woman wondered if perhaps people of color in America are too sensitive about race. I'm here to tell you that some 25 years ago, I was this white woman. But I had a moment of racial literacy through a work assignment in which I was tasked with transcribing over 250 interviews with middle-class black Americans about their experiences of everyday racism. When I began that task, I was like that woman Ijeoma Alua describes, assuming that complaints about racism were simply because people were being too sensitive. The experience, though, of close listening, of typing every word, and looking at the broad patterns in those interviews of repeated, constant, unrelenting racism faced by these very well-educated and accomplished people, many with multiple degrees, much more accomplished than any of the people in my family, most of whom had never attended college or even finished high school, made the evidence of racism undeniable. At the end of that experience, I was a different person. And I'm here to tell you as well that it is still painful and a racially stressful experience for me to tell you about my own illiteracy. Since then, I've been wondering about how we replicate, um, how I might replicate these moments of racial literacy for others. My response has been writing books, giving talks like this one, and teaching. But I wonder about how to scale those moments. 
And I wonder about what your moments of racial literacy are. I recently met a woman in DC who works in tech, her name is Emily. When I explained the concept of racial literacy to her, she intuitively understood it and volunteered her own moment of racial literacy happened when she read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. She said, I didn't know that stuff. I mean, I knew that there were racial disparities in incarceration, but I just thought, well, it embarrasses me to say this now, but I just thought black people committed more crime. I didn't realize there was this whole system that made sure black people got locked up. There are many barriers to uh, racial literacy in tech, and I think one of them, as she was talking, it occurred to me, is the embarrassment and the shame of not knowing, um, especially for white people, but maybe just for all people who think of themselves as smart. How did I not know this? Can be a question that's tinged with embarrassment or even shame. Racial literacy uh, allows us and uh, provides us with a capacity to build an emotional capacity to acknowledge and then get past the shame and the embarrassment of not knowing. But I think the biggest barrier to racial literacy in tech is thinking that race doesn't matter in tech. There are lots of ways that there is color blindness in technology, and I've written some about this. I'm gonna drop my pen. And color blindness in tech is pervasive. There's a particular form of it in technology, and I can talk more about that in the Q&A. Um, but this, too, is a form of illiteracy. We must face our racial illiteracy when it comes to tech, which brings me back to where I, brings me back to the place I started with this, which is why now is the time for racial literacy in tech. The inequality of the next 20 years is being built now. Without racial literacy in tech, without a specific and conscious effort to address race, we will certainly be recreating a high-tech Jim Crow, a segregated, divided, unequal future, sped up, spread out, and automated through algorithms, AI, and machine learning. I know that some will say that this is too big a problem, too complicated to ever address. To those, I would simply respond, it is too important not to try. Although it would be naive to think that racial literacy could dismantle structures of inequality, I do believe that racial inequality can enable us to do less harm with the technology we are creating and using. Not everything that is faced can be changed, James Baldwin reminds us, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Won't you join us in building this new future? Thank you. <laughs>